This episode of Real Ag Radio is brought to you by Ag Expert. Go from field to farm with Canada's most trusted, most secure farm management software. Ag Expert keeps you on top of it all, no matter where you are. Get started for free at agexpert.ca. It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Tuesday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a part of your work day. And of course, a big shout out as well to everybody listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast. No matter where you are, Canada, the U.S. or beyond, it is great to have you with us. Love this time of the year because, you know, through the winter months, you, you, some of you are listening to us in, in the barn but in the summer, we we get a chance to talk to a lot of you while you're out there in the fields or in the pasture doing the work that we're talking about, you know, related to agriculture. And so this is kind of a fun time and uh, really do appreciate uh, as you're getting seed in the ground or you're doing whatever you're doing on the farm or the ranch that uh, you uh, make us a part of that day, like I say at the beginning of the show every day. Today we are going to, I'm going to give you a bit of a taste, a couple of examples of different podcasts that we're regularly putting out at realagriculture.com. So what we're going to do is we're going to hear a successors podcast, a piece of an episode. Now this is hosted by Kara Oosterhaus of Real Agriculture. And what she does is she focuses in on young people in the industry. And we've heard a lot recently about how, you know, where, where are all the young people in the industry, well, there's a lot of them, okay? And, and Kara really kind of goes back and forth across the country and, and talks to a lot of young people in industry and on the farm that are really, really the future and making a difference. So today we're going to hear uh, from a recent episode. She's talking to Garrett Harima, and uh, he's from Eastern Canada, or from Ontario, I should say. And uh, we're going to hear a piece of that. We're also going to hear a Mind Your Farm business went up today. This is fresh. This is very, very fresh. The uh, The audio just went up today. Actually, it's it's in video form as well. You can find it at realagriculture.com, mindyourfarmbusiness.com, or at the Real Agriculture YouTube channel. So lots of options. It's an interview, a discussion on succession and farm transition with Elaine phrase of Seeds of Encouragement. And, and specifically, we talk about timelines. Now, whether it's a succession plan or it's just a project on the farm, you, you got to put in milestones. You got to put in some timelines, some guides that you're working towards. Otherwise, you're sort of just sort of flittering across uh, the, the pendulum of time. You need timelines. And so that's what Elaine and I chat about in this episode. We'll have a clip of that. We'll also have a product spotlight today with GFL. We're going to hear from Dan Aberhart. Yes. And uh, Dan's got some information on a, a a really, really cool approach to to sulfur. So we'll hear from Dan. And we'll also have time today for the top ag news stories of the day. Lots happening with Canada and China. There's an update on the Black, or Black Sea grain deal is another example, and uh, what should happen with grain inspections going forward. So a lot of chat about in the news today. If you have any feedback on today's show, we'd love to hear from you. Send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media platforms, or you can call that Real Ag Feedback Line. The number is 855-776-6147. Speaking of that feedback line, Scott from New Brunswick heard Friday's show. And we were talking about the need. We had Stuart Person from MMP on, as part of our panel. And one of the things we talked about is how we got to think more strategically in Canada about infrastructure, not only from an export perspective, but also making sure that supplies and resources can move about the country. And we don't treat the Canadian Shield like it's some sort of impossible wall to overcome, which is what we typically do. Here's what Scott had to say. 
Hi, Sean. Scott Brown calling here in southern New Brunswick. Uh, just listened to your Friday episode about uh, fertilizer transportation from from Western Canada and St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, it's extremely frustrating to, to hear that and, and to be in New Brunswick and see the rail cars go through our town uh, to our potash mine here in Sussex, New Brunswick. We have a nutrient potash mine that has been idle uh, for since 2016. Um, I, I think we need uh, provincial governments like uh, Ontario, Quebec, Eastern uh, or, or Eastern uh, the Maritime provinces to get on board and get this mine back up and running. It, it's mind blowing to me that the thought of bringing potash from Belarus or Russia into our ports when we have a mine sitting here for God knows what reason it's not running. Uh, but yeah, it's just uh, I think I've called in about it before, but. Uh, I, I think it would be a good topic to bring up and, and put pressure on our Minister of Agriculture to to see what we can do to get that mine up and running. Thanks, John. Bye. Really good questions there from Scott. Really appreciate uh, you calling into the Real Like Feedback line. Scott showed how easy it is. Now, I'm going to reach out to Nutri and try to find out why this mine is is idle. Why, you know, why at this time, especially with what's transpired here in the last three years, why this is still idle? Maybe there's a good reason from the company's perspective. Now, if, if any of you out there that are listening know more about this, because Scott's question is really good. You can tell he's frustrated, and, and rightly so. Let me know. We'd love to hear from, from you. And, and be like Scott, 855-776-6147. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Real Ag Radio. It is time for today's product spotlight. Joining me on the line is Roger Gunning with U.S. Borax. So what's something that growers in North America don't necessarily think about when it comes to their fertilizer? There could be heavy metals like arsenic and fertilizers that have not gone through the stringent refining process. It is well known that arsenic can be toxic to plants as well as animals. If you you have a high level of arsenic in your fertilizer and you, you don't know it, it will accumulate in the soil and then it'll be taken up in your crops. Refined borates, like those we sell here at US Borax, go through a seven step process to help ensure at the end our product is pure. How then can, can growers get more information if they want to know more about US Borax? Definitely take a look at our website, agriculture.borax.com, or give me a phone call, 773 923 7420. All right, Roger, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Did you know that Pioneer now has a full lineup of Enlist E3 soybeans? Take a look at Pioneer brand Enlist E3 soybeans for the highest yield potential and for the best agronomic package and herbicide trade options. From the lab to the field, Pioneer brand Enlist E3 soybeans are the best in beans, period. Ask your local Pioneer representative about Enlist E3 Beans. Whenever there is a federal election in the future, going back to what Scott was just saying in in terms of his frustrations as as he watched rail cars full of potash go by and there's there's an idle potash mine right there in New Brunswick, I hope in the next federal election, there could actually be a conversation about some of these strategic Canadian issues, but I'm not going to get my hopes up because you, you, you listen to the prime minister last week at the, at the liberal party convention, you listen to some of the stuff that Mr. Polyev is talking about it, we're, we're, in many ways, we're, we're just trying to trigger emotions from people Instead of actually having real adult conversations about what is good for not only the Canadian economy, the future of Canada, and, and what it's going to take to get us there, and, 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 and really talk about some of the nuts and bolts and how. That, that's, that's the part that is continually just n- n- missing <laughs> from some of these, 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 these conversations. And it's they're just too long term for them. They are in short. We we've moved to where the political cycle and Canada's 
in a way better situation this from this standpoint than say the U.S. is. But these the, the cycles become so short; they feel like that there's just no incentive for a politician to think long term. They, they talk about the long term from five hundred thousand feet, but there's no actual work or detail that goes into some of this stuff. It's it's, it's disappointing. I hope that changes, but I'm not going to get my hopes up. This segment's brought to you by Granny Bore from U.S. Borax. Ask for it by name. Go to borax.com. Okay, we're now going to hear a clip of uh, the Successors podcast. And you can get the Successors podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Uh, Kara does a great job talking and featuring young people in the industry, on the farm, on the ranch, in industry, in research, going into academia. It's, it's a great cross-section of people. And, and you, you learn that the industry is in very, very strong hands. A recent episode, she had a chance to talk to a farmer from Ontario. Here's a piece of that conversation. For today's episode of the Successors podcast, we're headed out east to Uxbridge, Ontario to catch up with Garrett Herma. Garrett, how is it going today? Good. How are you, Kara? I am doing well. Okay. For those that are not familiar with Ontario, tell me where you are located in Ontario. Basically, we're about an hour northeast of the city of Toronto. If you if you go straight north of Lake Simcoe or straight south of Lake Simcoe and straight north of the city of Pickering, uh, you'll pretty much land right in where we are. You know, we're we're in an area where it's very uh, developed area and a lot of a lot of traffic and. Uh, everything else so that's kind of where where we farm out of tell me a bit about your operation what keeps you busy over there for the most part we're uh 85 milking cows and run about 750 to 800 acres of cropland run a bit of a custom farming operation largely big square baling a little bit of planting um and then custom silage bagging as well so that's pretty much what keeps us busy but Definitely the cows are where our uh, priorities are at. So have you always been involved in dairy? Was that a family operation before you came into it? Or or talk a bit about that. Yeah, so a bit of a family history. We immigrated from Holland on the Harima side back in 1951, I believe. Uh, First settlement was actually in Uxbridge, where we worked for a a neighboring farm. Uh, Worked there for about a year and then... Uh, two or three farms between Oxbridge and King City, which is just uh, about a half hour north of Toronto. Worked on two farms there, and then the family rented two farms in that area for 10 years milking cows. They finally were able to purchase the, the home farm in 1960, where they uh, moved up, and my grandfather Gary and his dad Wilbur farmed up there getting into the 80s and the 90s my dad and my uncle ron farmed together in the early 2000s my dad decided to take on municipal politics did that for 10 years and then um, my uncle decided to retire and dad said he was going to retire from politics and here we are and right now currently it's myself and my dad primarily my sister's been back home for a little bit but she's heading off she's in the the livestock showing circuit with uh, the dairy side more so so she's heading off with that and uh yeah that's kind of a bit of a a farm history for uh for where what we have here so your dad is still currently involved with the farm yes very he's he he's head honcho well i i think it's actually mother that's head honcho because she's (laughs) the one that that deals with the bucks and says no when we we want to spend money um but but dad's kind of top dog around here and then myself and we have a a real top-notch herdsman that that strictly works with the cows he doesn't do any field work really really lucky to have him and a lot of our success uh with the dairy over the past 10 years have been because of him so but yeah my my dad and i work real close together always have when he was in politics we we he and i would get a lot of stuff done on weekends because he had meetings during the week so uh we kind of have a, a bit of a synergy when it comes to to what we do, and and he and I can think along the similar lines and be able to think in a way to move the farm forward and get things done. Have you started discussing succession at all, or that hasn't really been a topic that's been breached yet? Well, well, it's definitely been a topic. It's just a matter of getting uh, sitting down and, and starting to plan some stuff. You know, uh, between some family members that are still have are involved with the farm and such and uh, 
trying to figure out what's best for everyone. So that's something that within the next few years, we're really focused on trying to get done because we want the farm to succeed and, and move on in the future generations. So do you think succession planning is something you guys are going to tackle internally yourselves? Or are you going to bring somebody in to help or again, haven't really thought that far? I, I think definitely, you know, working with our accountants, the number one uh, thing to, to bring in and, and make sure it goes smoothly and make sure that Things make sense for, from a, a financial standpoint, tax basis, what have you. I make sure everything's fair for, for the rest of the family members that are still involved. Absolutely. Is there any, any intention for your sister to come back full time to the farm, do you think? Not not at this present time, but if there is a, an opportunity where she feels she wants to come back, you know, the, the spot is there. You know, she's been as much of a part of an operation as anything. Uh, especially on the cow side, not so much the cropping side. It is a family farm, so so if if that's the case, you know we we gotta make sure that she's a part of the farm for sure. So talk about the dairy operation. Is there a specific part you fit into, or do you guys kind of all work on everything together? For the most part, I my self proclaimed title is feed and crop manager. So kind of my forte is making sure the crops are in. You know the we're getting the best yield, the best quality feed that we can, you know, dealing everything from, from planting to spraying, working with our agronomist and our feed nutritionist to make sure everything's balanced right. Um, so that's where I fit in. But, you know, uh, of course, kind of if anyone's away or what have you, I'm the first guy that gets called, whether it's breeding cows or, or treating or whatever. I've taken on the role of, of calf feeding primarily, you know, because you want a good start with the calves. So I've been really focused on that as well. Milking, not so much with my sister being home up until recently. She She's done a lot, a lot of milking and is pretty good at it. So, um, and I like milking. There's nothing wrong with it. But if there's other jobs that I can do while someone else is willing to milk, we'll, we'll go do that. And the other part of where I fit in is seems to be I'm spending a lot more time in the shop working on equipment with the price of shop rate and stuff. If there's the ability uh, or if we have the ability to pull something in the shop and working on it ourselves, we, we think we're saving um, quite a bit of money doing that versus having to send it off to a dealer that, that's charging, you know, 100 to 120 bucks an hour for shop rate, which they got to in order to make their ends meet. But at the same time, if we can do it more affordably at home, we're seeing a big benefit for sure. And I know right to repair is something we talk about frequently here. Do you find there's there's a lot of things you can't actually work on in the shop that you have to send away because you just simply don't have the, the tech or the programs to fix it? Yes, short answer. We're 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 all red equipment on the on the tractor side anyways. So um, I haven't really seen anything come through, at least on the media end, on what Case's plan is with right to repair. But definitely it's in the back of my mind that are we going to have to look at um, some of these packages uh, in order to more so to diagnose. I think that's the biggest thing for me is diagnosing it, not necessarily repairing it. A lot of this stuff is nuts and bolts unless you're getting into some other stuff. But di- diagnosing this stuff seems to be the biggest thing. So we're going to have to be prepared, I think, within the next five years to have that the diagnosing tools available to us, especially if we're going to try and keep up to date on some of the cropping uh, or cropping equipment. It is higher tech stuff. You know, we're, we're dealing with starting to think about variable rate fertilizer. We bought a new planter, but it doesn't have um any variable rate stuff but having said that you know five years down the road maybe it's time we start looking at uh variable rate fertilizer and seed and stuff so so all this stuff is in the back of our mind with our equipment purchases and having those diagnostic diagnostic tools i think is going to be a big benefit coming up and you mentioned you know five years from now talk about technology and Especially on the dairy side, like when it comes to milking, how, how has that changed since, you know, even in the last decade? What, when you look at robotic t- technology, robots have come so far compared to the first couple that were at the outdoor farm show back in the, the late 90s. For ourselves, we put in a parlor when we built a new barn about six years ago, just from the standpoint of we were too many cows for one robot and not enough cows to justify the second robot and our between my dad our our herdsmen and everyone else around 
We seem to have enough labour that we can make a parlour work and, and we think it's the right choice. Our barn is laid out to put in robots if we decide to go that route. There's nothing wrong with robots. It's just whatever fits your operation. They're, they're incredibly, incredibly neat pieces of equipment. And, uh, you know, I, I, I always enjoy listening to neighbours and friends that have them. Data collection on the feed side is something we're starting out with. We're playing around with a, a program that tracks all our feed usage on the mixer. So that's one thing. One upgrade we had on the parlor was we went with these auto post-dipping milk claws. So for those that don't know the, the prep procedure when it comes to milking cows, you, you pre-dip with an iodine, you wipe it off, strip the, the teat out to get any uh, dirt in, in the first little bit of milk out, and then you throw the milker on. And afterwards, after you're done milking, you post-dip with an iodine again to make sure that no, um, or minimize the amount of of pathogens and stuff that get in the udder. So what technology came out of England, actually, was the ability to post-dip right in the teacup, and then afterwards it does a sanitized flush for in between each cow. So we're able to significantly reduce our mass data spread within the herd. So that's one techno- piece of technology we've adapted to. This rumination, um, you know, watching the cows digestion and stuff, uh, is something that I think we're going to look towards within the next five to ten years, uh, just to catch those cows that might be off feed earlier. You can track them on the milk production that is read through the the milk meters back to the computer. But rumination, some of the the statistics are showing that you're able to catch these cows a little bit easier. Having said that, you can get carried away with technology. I think yeah, but I I think buying the technology that's going to make your farm more efficient in being able to, to catch these cows that are off sooner, um, I think are the two that, that we're going to really try and focus on. Like you said, there's so much different technology out there. When deciding what is quote unquote right for your farm, do you mostly look at, you know, sticker price? Do you look at what increases efficiency on your farm? What's kind of that determination for you? That's a really Great question. When when we moved into the new facility, it solved a lot of our technology questions, I guess, when we brought in a milking system that can track milk production and conductivity and blend the milk and activity and all those things. So, you know, those things we... I think our priorities when it comes to it. Looking at uh, education, you you obviously did your high school. Did you do any post-secondary education? Yeah, um... For, for high school, I think one thing that maybe gave me a little bit different experience was I did a co-op placement with a welding shop. And that, that was just a bit different um, between being able to do a lot of or a little bit more of our own fabrication and stuff and being able to repair steel and, and, and problems like that. That, that was a big asset. Um, and unfortunately, the shop that I worked at has, has closed up, but I'm still in touch with the boss. And, you know, he's been a... a a bit of a mentor in in sort of the business side. Post secondary education, I went to Kempville College, which was a former uh, campus under University of Guelph, where I uh, just did a diploma in agriculture, uh, but tried to specialize more so on the dairy and side of things. Working alongside my dad so close, he was always the crop guy, so I learned a lot from him. So I wanted to learn a little bit more from cows in Ontario for those who don't know up until recent history, there was three agriculture uh, campuses when I was able to go to school. There was uh, Ridgetown, which is still ex- exists today. Uh, you, you know, you talk about SWAC, a big conference down there. It, it is the uh, one of the better agriculture schools uh, in Canada, in my opinion. Then there was Kempville, which was definitely a dairy-focused school. And then uh, Alfred, which was the French school. So between the three of those covered a lot of the agriculture um, education needs in the area. So that's, yeah, Kempville was a a learning experience. I mean, 30% of your time was spent in class and the rest of it was networking and meeting with friends. And, you know, there's there's still a tight knit uh, group of us, about a, a dozen of us that talk on a daily basis. If you want to hear more of this discussion with Garrett or others that Kara has with young people in the industry, 
Make sure you go to realagriculture.com and uh, search successors or get it wherever you get your podcast. Uh, great stuff from Carrie Strauss. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to have a product spotlight with GFL. We're talking sulfur. When we come back, you're listening to Real Ag Radio. As you head out into the field this season, the Corn School's got you covered. Everything from tillage discussions, weed control info, field trial results, yield strategies, and more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. It's now time for a product spotlight, uh, all about the Pest and Predator podcast, brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grain Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Joining me right now is Dr. John Gavlowski. He's an entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture. Okay, we've got another season of the Pest and Predator podcast. John, what, what is the Pest and Predator podcast, and what can listeners expect in what I can't believe is going to be season four? Yeah, it's a series of interviews with entomologists from across the prairies. And we're talking about pests and predators that are common in Western Canada. And what we'll be doing is we'll be bringing you the latest information on pests that you may encounter in your fields and the beneficials that help to control them. And with each episode, we feature a different entomologist on a different topic. Um, Listeners will also learn about uh, the role that beneficial insects can play in their fields and ways that we can protect them and some scouting tips. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio. It's now time for a product spotlight with GFL. And we're joined right now by the president of Aberhart Egg Solutions. It is Dan Aberhart. Dan, great chat with you. Hey, thanks so much for having us on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to uh, talk to you again. So a lot of stuff happening in this market. Uh, talk about how is how Biosol is handled and applied and, and, and maybe talk about what it is. Right on. Well, thanks. Sean, uh, biosol is a blend of elemental sulfur and compost. And really, it's unique because it's handled through spin spreaders and live bottoms and conveyors and loaders because of the compost. Now, the compost serves as a carrier to reduce the risk of fire and, and the dusting that's normally associated with elemental sulfur. It also gives us a little bit, bit of kickstart to the bacterial activity that converts elemental sulfur to sulfate in the field. So, Bringing this product to market, we have a very unique um, sales channel here in terms of uh, the applicators that apply this. Uh, they're able to, through their calibrated specialized spin spreaders, uh, apply this product, even though it's a variable part- particle size product, onto fields very accurately at high rates. And that's how we get the strategy that we all know it's biosol today. Yeah, th- this feels like a product that has a great fit for a, a lot of the discussions about sustainability uh, right now that's happening out in the marketplace. So what makes Biosol unique as a delivery system for sulfur compared to other options? I think a big component of, of this as a unique uh, delivery system for sulfur is the compost. And now we know compost has tremendous benefits for the environment. We know that by composting other uh, urban landfills, we can reduce those landfills by half and take that methane gas associated with organics and landfills out of there. And it's a little known fact, but uh, for folks that you know want to get compost onto their land, there's really like an economic threshold, Sean, of about 150 kilometers where it makes sense given the nutrient volume. But if we're able to move this product 10 times that, we're able to move compost 10 times with the mixing in of elemental sulfur. And so it really is a, a really... Uh, interesting uh, homegrown solution for doing something that's common sense that benefits the environment, but most of all uh, uh, farmers in Western Canada. So Dan, how often do I have to uh, apply biosol? Is this an every year thing or every one or two years? Like how often do I have to do it? One of the unique characteristics of this product is that we can put on super long-term applications. We're talking three to five years because of the variable particle size. Uh, we've got product, uh, product particle sizes anywhere from, uh, you know, dust size to pea size. They all amortize at different rates given this surface area. So what you'll find is we can put on a three to five year application in, in, in one go with the applicators. 
And that sulfur will become available with growing conditions, uh, temperature, oxygen, moisture, and it releases the sulfur as sulfate to the plant, generally speaking, with, with good growing conditions. So that, that works fantastic for farmers agronomically, gets dr- uh, the, the you know ammonium sulfate out of their drill every year. That's one of the things that folks love the most. And agronomically, we're really confident in, you know, in the millions of acres that have gone on thus far. So when you look at this from a Western Canadian standpoint, why, why do you believe this is such a unique opportunity? This has been a, a great opportunity to be involved with just so many fronts. But what I, what I, you know, warms our hearts the most is the fact that this is a locally sourced, reconstituted ingredients going back onto farm fields. So it's it's often the case that we're taking food that was uh, neglected or thrown out from the grocery stores, reconstituting that into compost, blending it with elemental sulfur, which is a byproduct of the oil field, right in our back door in Hannah, Alberta, the purpose-built site. And that is getting distributed all over Western Canada for farmers, as an extremely economical source of sulfur, logistically, folks love getting AMS out of the drill. Agronomically, it's a super long-lasting source of sulfur that works with Mother Nature. And in today's volatile world of supply chains and you know pricing, uh, we're proud to be very consistently uh, sourced locally and sustainably. Uh, very cool. Okay, so if somebody wants more information on Biosol, where do they uh, where do they find it? Check it out at www.gflagra.com. Great stuff. And is is springtime the best time to apply or is it fall? Uh, you can do both. Springtime can be a little bit challenging, you know, uh, logistically. Uh, we do the lion's share in the fall, but uh, spring is also an op- option for you. Great stuff. Really appreciate it. Hey, Dan, thanks so much for joining us here today on Real Ag Radio. Thanks, Sean. I really appreciate it. Okay, remember that, everybody. When you're thinking sulfur, be thinking biosol. That was great. Honestly, a very, very cool, as Dan said, local story there as well. We'll be right back on Real Lag Radio right after this. Join us for the Canadian Beef Industry Conference, August 15th to 17th at Calgary, Alberta. Spend time networking on the trade show floor, hear from keynote speakers, take in breakout sessions designed to increase profit, manage your rangeland, and navigate trends. Get up close to advanced techniques and hands-on demos, and experience bullfighting at the closing party. Proud, innovative, and loyal, we are beef. Registration is now open. Visit CanadianBeefIndustryConference.com for full details and to register. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. There's a lot of seed treatments on the market, okay? There's a lot of options, a lot of choices, but you need to think about Heads Up. Heads Up Seed Treatment, protect your beans from rhizotonia, root rot, white mold, and SDS with Heads Up. Visit your nearest Agromart location or visit headsupst.com to learn more. Family farm succession or family farm transition, however you want to put that, it is a really, really big threat to our industry. Now, we heard earlier, we're talking about younger people and trying to, you know, the, the future is very bright. Now, a part of them staying on the farm is to have successful farm transition. Now, how do we do that? There's a lot of ways to, to make that happen. There is success stories out there. A lot of times we focus on the disasters. My family was a part of a disaster. <laughs> I know this very, very well. Okay. Uh, Some of you probably have shared experiences. One time we will have a pint and we will talk about it. Recently, actually just today, uh, we put up a new episode of the Mind Your Farm Business podcast where I had a conversation with Elaine Fraze of Seeds of Encouragement. She's a family farm succession coach and expert in this area. And we talked about the need for a timeline so that this whole transition doesn't last 30 years because that's what can happen. 
Let's just talk about timelines and succession with Elaine Frey's. Here's a portion of that conversation. I was reading a recent blog on your website, farmfamilycoach.com, where it, it talked about the, the pain of not knowing uh, in reference to the future and timelines and expectations. Talk about how that impacts farm succession. So the pain of not knowing comes from my coaching training where William Bridges had this concept, um, Sean, of being in the neutral zone. So just picture you're in a pasture in an old pickup that has a stick shift on the floor and it's in neutral, right? You're wobbling it back and forth and you're not going anywhere because you're in neutral. And what needs to end is the pain of not knowing or the uncertainty about your future. And so if you're a founder listening to this, or if you're the next gen successor listening to this, it's the same for both of you because both of you or all of your families need certainty about what the future is going to be. And particularly um, when I coach families, I, I call it my three C's. So the first one is everybody needs clarity of expectation. What do you expect for income stream? What do you expect for housing? And what do you expect for fairness? But the second question is what we're going to focus on today, which is the certainty of timelines and agreements. Because we can talk till the cows come home, but I have this other saying, talk does not cook rice. And so I have um, um, a, a little uh, prop here. Well, maybe I lost it. No, it's under my book. This is the magic word, by when. Ah. By when. And this is a very powerful um, short sentence, very clear, very concise. By when, Dad, will you and Mom give us an opportunity to buy equity in this farm? And like you said, small farms, big farms, doesn't matter, Sean. These are family business principles. And I think we should also be clear, are we talking about the estate plan? No, we're not talking about when Dad and Mom pass or when you might pass. We're talking about the transfer of labor, management, and ownership. And labor transfers really fast because young backs are strong backs and young people have more energy than the older farmers do, correct? But the by when about management, when does someone drive on my yard and our certified seed business and say, I want to talk to the manager. And he goes to talk to our 35-year-old son, Ian, who now runs Boys of Ain Select Seeds. And he doesn't go to talk to Wes, my husband, who's the aging founder, because Wes is no longer the main manager. And then the next piece is, when does our son, who's 35, get equity? And he, quite fortunately, already has some because he has purchased Boys Vane Select Seeds Limited. So for everybody listening, by when is a very powerful question because it puts a timeline or a target of when this pain of not knowing is going to end. Just like those of us who wear diamond rings, you know, an engagement ring goes on a finger. What's the next question? By when are you getting married? What, <laughs> yeah. Right? And we've, we've had this big backlog of marriages not happening because they couldn't get a venue during the, the great pause. And my poor nephew in Toronto, he has to wait till September 14th of 2024 to get married because he can't find a venue. But of course, people who really want to get married work really hard at setting a date for the wedding. And so that's a good reminder to all of us. What's the date for you to get your wills updated? What's the date for you to step back without stepping away and direct more people to the next generation? So there's there's lots of things involved here. Yeah. So how do you know the right time? Like, because that, that question could be taken the wrong way. You know, you're, I'm pushing you're, you out of here, man. Yeah. I, you know, why are you trying to push me out of here? Or like, so... Timing's important, like you know, in most things in life. How how do how to how to know when to do that? Or, you know, even as the older generation, you know, even if the younger generation is not asking by when, you know, how do you how do you know the the right time to say, you know, here's the deal, you know, here's by when. I know you're not asking. You may be thinking about it, but here's what my intent. Like th this can, this feels like it it makes sense to me. But there's probably a lot of examples where this is a really super delicate conversation. Well, and you just skimmed over a word that you almost didn't speak, Sean, and you said intent. 
Mm. So conflict resolution, there's this whole thing about intent, action, effect. And I have no idea what you're thinking or what next question you want to ask me until it comes out of your mouth and I hear it. So in in transition planning, which is the word I prefer to use rather than succession, because transition is an unfolding, it's an ongoing journey. And so for for your intent as a founder, how do you know the manager or the next generation is ready to manage? Well, you start putting some expectations in place and you have timelines for a learning plan. And you say, by the time you are even coming back to the farm with our son, we said, by the time you're 27, which is a timeline, we need to know, are you in or you're out? The other timeline that really messes around with people's heads in, in transition planning is, how many people are allowed to come back mm. to our farm? Yeah. And, is there, and is there any deadline on that? And so the founders, the parents need to be very clear about their intent. And their intent might be, our intent is to have a viable, profitable farm. This farm can only support, say, two or three families, but we have more than one successor. So we'll have to see at what point is the farm viable to, to um support more than two to three families. So really it's about your intent is not to be pushy. And some and some founders will say, oh, Elaine, this feels horrible. I feel like I'm being pushed and shoved off this farm. And I built this farm for 40 years and this isn't fair. Blah, 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 blah. I go, whoa, yeah. stop. Mm-hmm. Who told you that? And again, Brene Brown is this great say- saying, Sean, This is the story you're telling yourself. And so I want people to stop having these stories going around in their head. And I want them to ask, I'm just curious, dad. I'm just curious, mom. Or I'm just curious, granddad. What do you want your role to be as you age in place and step back step away with or step back without stepping away on this farm because it's not my intent as the successor to push you off i need you i need you to uh, drive the combine i need you to help me with the marketing i need you to tell me you know where the low spots are what you what what you've discovered or all your wisdom that you've built up over the last 45 years so i think if you're clear about my intent is not to push you away but my intent is to get clarity, then you have then you have to really challenge what assumptions people are making. The other thing in the article in the blog that you were reading is the reason that people don't set timelines is because they're not ready, because they don't know what they want. So I'll ask an old farmer. Well, an old's a relative term because anybody yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, anybody over 40 listening to this is technically an old farmer. Yeah. So ask an older farmer, so what do you want? And they'll go. Well, Lane, I don't know. I said, well, get back to me because I can't work with you until you are clear about what a good day on the farm looks like to you going forward. And then in terms of getting ready for trusting the next generation to be taking over management or trusting the next generation not to screw up and lose the farm, because that's the other story, Sean. You ask a farmer, an aging farmer, could you tell me what you're really afraid of? He says, well, Elaine, I've never told anybody this before, but I'll share it with you. I'm really afraid of failure. I said, seriously, your daughter has been here for 10 years with her partner and your son's been here for who knows how long. And they've proven to you that they can do the work. They have great financial literacy. They make great decisions. Plus, you're not going anywhere. So why would you fail? But Sean, people are afraid of all kinds of things that they, they don't talk about. Right. And that's the sadness there. Of yeah. not knowing. the pain, and again, that's the pain of not knowing. You have no idea what people are afraid of, and why they aren't making timelines and deadlines unless you ask. Them. A lot of this comes down to communication. Communication is not easy. It is not easy. Also, sometimes these negotiations lack trust. They lack some honesty. There's a lot of things that can get in the way of you having a, a successful farm transition story, but. Not having a timeline is a big, that's a structural problem. That's a structural issue. It's not an emotional thing. It is a structural issue and it increases the chance that your transition fails. Think about building a house. You have no timelines. What happens? Project kind of doubles in budget. It 
cost or you know, it takes way longer than you initially thought, you got to have a timeline. You got to have milestones. So uh, you can hear that entire conversation by going to mindyourfarmbusiness.com. And once again, big shout out and thanks to RBC Rural Bank for being the sponsor of the Mind Your Farm Business podcast. This one is in video too. So go to uh, our YouTube channel and uh, check it out. You can watch the video of the conversation with myself and Elaine. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to get to the top ag news stories of the day right after this. ABJ Agri-Products is North America's exclusive distributor for air bubble jets and easy jets. These sprayer nozzles reduce the number of driftable droplets and at the same time maintain a uniform droplet size, primarily between 300 and 400 micron, ensuring more even dispersion of your chemical products, providing reduced drift and increased plant coverage. Let us help improve your spraying operation by visiting abjagra.com. That's A-B-J-A-G-R-I dot com. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. I never really intended to do it, but we, we did kind of tie the two podcasts we played today and gave you a, a bit of a sneak peek at them. They're kind of related, right? You know, the tying of the, here's the young people. We have young people in this industry. We need to make sure that we find ways to transition them in into this industry long term. And this is complicated because the dollars are big. And Stuart person from MMP talked about this on Friday's show. We don't have a people problem. We have a capital problem. And, and that's where, th- that's what kind of into this, one of the pieces of the puzzle that makes it really, really difficult is, is how do you do that? So uh, if you have any thoughts on family farm transition succession, uh, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Appreciate your comments and thoughts. Let's get to the top ag news stories of the day. It is sponsored by Coke Agronomic Services, makers of Tribune Nitrogen Stabilizer. Protect your UAN from all three forms of nitrogen loss. Learn more about Tribune and other nutrient management, nutrient protection, and seed enhancement solutions at cokeagronomicservices.ca. Big thanks to Coke. They've, they've been big time supporters of Real Ag Radio here this spring. Thank them uh, for that. And uh, please check them out, Coke Agronomic Services. Ca. These fires in Alberta, let me tell you what, it, it just feels way too early for this. So Alberta has declared a state of emergency as several wildfires burn across the province. As of late Sunday night, nearly 30,000 people have been evacuated from their homes. The province says there are currently 88 active wildfires in the forest protection area, 25 of which are classified as out of control. For grain farmers, many have been cultivating fire breaks or helping neighbors. However, Those with livestock, including cattle on pasture, time is of the essence to get these animals to safety. Now, the Alberta beef producers, they have a webpage devoted to the wildfire situation, including an interactive map of those offering boarding for livestock. You can visit it by uh, going to the ABP website. They also have a list of a bunch of contact numbers, emergency contact numbers as, as well. The the province says that evacuated farmers and ranchers can contact the wildfire resource line at three sorry three one zero four four five five with agriculture and livestock related questions. So please do that if you need. You know it's interesting. Yesterday I was talking to a farmer about booking him for the uh, farmer rapid fire, and he said I can't. Uh, I'm shutting down the cedar, and he's a pilot, helicopter pilot, and he was going to to help fight the fire. So there's people in agriculture, stepping up like that. So big uh, two thumbs up for uh, for you, Wade, um, for, for doing that. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk with you in a few weeks. Scary situation. Canada braces for trade retaliation from China. On Monday, the federal government expelled Chinese diplomat Zhao Wei for interfering in Canadian politics by targeting conservative MP Michael Chong's family. This uh, this has been ongoing for a couple of weeks, and it's it's just... China's going to China. The Chinese embassy condemned Canada's move and vowed to take resolute countermeasures and all consequences arising therefrom shall be borne by the Canadian side. 
<laughs> that's Darth Vader like from China. However, it didn't say which of those retaliatory measures would what the, what they would look like. So, of course, you think canola right away. We think beef. We think pork. We think wheat. We think pulses. I, I guess everything's on the table, and we'll have to see. Now we're going to see that this is where that this is where kind of interests collide. Uh, especially on the right, because you know, I, I think there's a lot of conservatives that want Canada to be a little bit tougher on China, a little bit a la what we saw from former President Trump, kind of like you know, t- you know, being honest about China. The, the problem is, is that China is one of the largest consumers of agricultural commodities. It's an important export market, and so th- this is where we see some some clashing. We'll have to see where this shakes out and where the retaliation lands, but something we're definitely following very closely. Russia is still not satisfied with its end of the Black Sea grain deal. Russia remains unsatisfied with how the issue of its agricultural exports as part of the Black Sea grain deal is being resolved. TASS news agency quoted Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Vershinin as saying on Saturday, after the latest talks with the top United Nations official, the Kremlin said Russian President Vladimir Putin had not yet responded to proposals from the UN Secretary General on how to extend and improve the deal. Meanwhile, Ukrainian officials say Russia has effectively stopped the, the current Black Sea grain deal by refusing to register incoming vessels. There are th- th- There was a 60-day maturity on this version of the grain deal. There are several experts that we have had on this show or we have interviewed for stories on realagriculture.com that have said they believe this could be the last deal. So everybody's watching this. This is one of those events potentially that really moves the market. Um, it could, right? This is one we last week when we we're having market discussions on the Wednesday, we're going to put this to Randolph Glanville who'll be on the show tomorrow. But this is definitely one to watch. The federal government will extend the agri-food pilot until May 14th of 2025. Launched in May of 2020, the pilot program is designed to facilitate the transition of agricultural and food industry workers to permanent residency in Canada. Recruiting and retaining a skilled workforce is key to success for Canadian farmers and food processors, according to a government statement. Sugar, (laughs) have you heard of sugar highs? Well, there's one happening in the market. So, India and Thailand, two of the biggest exporters, had lackluster crops this season and are expected to face production woes next year. While more Indian cane crops are being turned into ethanol instead of the sweetener, sugar is near its highest in over a decade. I got a chart open here for uh, sugar futures, the ice sugar. And yeah, it, it, it looks... It is, uh, you, you know how all of our other commodities have been going in other directions? Sugar is going currently in <laughs> very much the opposite. Uh, there's also uh, an update here. Trade ministers of India and Canada will review the progress and talks of the proposed free trade agreement between the two countries besides discussing ways to strengthen economic ties in an official statement that was released on Monday. So Commerce and Industry Minister uh, Goyal, and Mary Ng, Minister of International Trade, Ex- Export Promotion, Small Business and Economic Development. Oh, way too many titles. We need a trade minister. I'll say it again. Uh, <laughs> they will co-chair the discussions of the 6th India-Canada Ministerial Dialogue on Trade and Investment. Uh, it happened yesterday in Ottawa. So it sounds like those the, the things went pretty well there based on a couple things that I had read. Of course, this is it is not easy to find a free trade agreement with India. It is it's sort of a pig in a poke in a way. There, there it's it's not easy. Non-tariff trade barriers are their game. This is Canada attempting to make some inroads in in India, which is one of the world's largest economies. Of course, we can't ignore it. You can't ignore it. If you have any feedback on today's show, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also call the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. Thanks, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. And, of course, we will chat again tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody. Cheers. Thank you for downloading this episode of Real Ag Radio, brought to you by Ag Expert. Go from field to farm with Canada's most trusted, most secure farm management software. Ag Expert keeps you on top of it all, no matter where you are. Get started for free at agexpert.ca.